On behalf of everyone at WNET, congratulations to Steve Adubato and the Caucus Educational Corporation on 25 great years of broadcasting. Hi, I'm Dario Cortez. Berkeley College believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect our daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and the partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. Roche, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com, everything Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Steve Adubato, welcome to the Tish WNET studios. I'm about to, at Lincoln Center, I'm about to introduce Get my profile. You. Get your face out of there. It's my profile. Get your Italian profile out of there. It's my profile. You recognize this guy? He's uh, Mario Cantone. He's an actor. He's a comedian. He's, uh, I knew him back in 1987. 88. 88. It's, he did a show called Steam Pipe Alley yeah. at WOR, Channel That's 9. That's where we were, Steam Pipe Alley, yeah. Back in the day. Back in the day, the heyday of Channel 9. Yeah, but you've done, done so much since then. I remember you, uh, also, everybody remembers you from Sex and the City. Yeah. You played, uh, you were connected to... Uh, Charlotte. Charlotte, I you know. were her I have uh, to tell you wedding this. planner. Yeah. No? <laughs> yeah. No? Yes, I was. It's hilarious. What? Because... <laughs> I know these it's things. Like, well, yeah. What? You, you have to kind of... Your wife told you this, right? She told me what we watched together. You watched it? You really of did? Of course. No. What do you think? I'm not in touch with these things. Well, there's a lot of guys who like, come up to me and go, my wife loves you or my girlfriend loves you. And I go, what about you? I love you too. I know that. Stop it. I'm feeling it. I know that. What about what are you? you? What are, where are you from originally? Uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I, I grew up in Stone. <laughs> yeah, there are Italians. <laughs> yeah, there are. There are Italians up there. Yeah, there's Italians up there. There's a ton of them. They're all Irish and Italian or a combination. You got along with the Irish? Yeah, I did get along with the Irish. I, I had no problem with the Irish. Why would I have a problem with the no, Irish? No, it's interesting. I don't go to St. Ba St. Patrick's Day Parade in Boston. It's too much. I don't That's like nice. parades. I don't like, I, I go to New Orleans twice a year. I do not go for Mardi Gras. I don't like that. That's crazy. not your thing. I don't like that crowd. I don't like, they had Mardi Gras, Super Bowl and Mardi Gras this year. I went on Wednesday after Mardi Gras when everyone was gone. That's how I you do don't it. Like the, I don't like being, I don't you like know, crowds. Early in your career, when I, you were loud. Yeah. You were. Well, I'm uh, depressed now, Steve. So now. You're not uh, depressed. Well, you know. I had just, we had Joey, Joey I'm here. I'm Italians. Reading. I love how Italians are. You're like, hey, you're not depressed. Shut up. You're not, no. We, we just had, seriously, we had Joey Pants in here talking about uh, oh, clinical depression. Well, I just did a play with reading with him. I worked with him for like a couple of months. He did a series. Oh, I. He gave him a lot of credit for no, coming did. out and talking about no, serious. He talks about the but mentally. You, men I'm not mentally ill, but I definitely am moody. Because if you want to share, share. I'm moody. You're not. And moody. I sleep late, but I'm going to tell you that's why I'm 53 years old and you look, look pretty great. good because I tell people sleep all you and can. And you exercise, you take care of yeah, yourself. Yeah, I do. I do. I work out and I'm fit and you do your thing. Tight and adorable. Well, let's not go on, but um, <sighs> seriously, how the heck have you continued to I, have a great career? I've held on to it. No, I'm being serious. I, seriously, I don't think I have a great career. You I work. I, I have a good Stop career. it. You work. I have a decent career. It's tough being a homosexual in the 80s and coming up in these mainstream comedy clubs. Very difficult. Very difficult. And also, um, you know, all those stand-up shows that people, they, they would come in and watch the comedians and book you for those th television shows, those stand-up shows. I did some of them. Networks would come in, look for people for shows, and I, I was always bypassed. I remember one time Peter McCauley came in for the Johnny Carson show, and he his visceral reaction was just like, 
you're so good. I don't know what we're going to do with you, but Johnny's going to love you, and we're putting you on the show. They booked me October 26, 1986. I was going to be on with Lily Tomlin, who was my idol. A week before I got a call, he said, I looked at your tape again, and it has a gay edge to it, and it'll make, I think it'll make Johnny gay nervous, edge. so we're, can, we're, we're canceling make Johnny it. Johnny nervous? Yeah. yeah. I don't even think Johnny even saw me, but, but he, they canceled me. How, how'd you deal with that? It was devastating, but I knew, I knew, it was like, this is going to be a tough haul. It's going to be a, a rough one, and it, 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 it has been. But you, you chose... Know, the career. I chose the career. I also chose to be a comedian. You know, if you back then, if you were just an actor, and you could do it as a comedian too, you could, you know, not say anything about your sexuality. You, but I couldn't live. When that did you way. come out? Twelve. I was twelve. Get out of here. Yeah, I was twelve. I said, I swear to God, I said to myself, "You're gay. You like boys." You I, said to yourself. I said to myself. That's not coming out. Yes, it is. That's the first step. Is when you say to yourself, "I like." Like I know what it means. I just like I know. Did you know you like women when you were twelve? Absolutely. Then they, what's the difference? I like how you think it's different. What do you mean? It's the same thing. It's you, not the same thing. You're aware thing. of it when you're aware of it. I think Italians are aware of it very early of their sexual uh, um, desires. You I think, think we the, know we're earlier? I think we, I don't know. Is I, there something about us? I think because there's a, I don't know. Maybe. I think it's development too. You know, everybody develops differently physically and mentally. You know, I know people that didn't come out till they were 40. Okay, so let You're going to come out in about two years. About so, two years, you know, that's what I'm It's coming out, yeah. My wife thinks it's going to be three, but here's the thing. <laughs> um, it was Jennifer. It was a joke, I think. So, here's He's the thing. It's mine, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> but here's what I'm thinking, seriously. What? When you did start communicating to others around you, particularly yeah. your family, because I, don't, I have a feeling our families weren't that much different, even though I was from Jersey and you were in Boston. Yeah. Uh, our family's from uh, Naples. Yeah, my mother's family was from Naples, and my father's family was from Sciacca, Sicily. Same difference. Yeah. Where, are you all Naples? All Naples, if, a little bit Sicily, but mostly Naples. A little bit of Sicily. Um, so here's my... That's where your looks come from, the Sicilian side, you know. That's what I'm thinking. So you know. Here's what I'm thinking. Yeah. When you started telling people yeah. around you, yeah. please tell me your family took you in and said, uh, we're with you. Well, I, know, I have to tell you, I, I, don't, I don't... My mother died when I was 21. I never said it to my mother. She was... Very scary, my mother. She scared me. She didn't like it. She was, she was not for it at all. Um, but then I also knew that she, you know, my my sister Marion had a best friend who was gay, and and I and I really look look up to my sister Marion, and I just thought, well, if she has this best friend that's gay, and my mother is okay with it, and Marion's really okay with it, my sister, I was like, then it's okay. Right. That kind of saved me a little bit. How about neighborhood stuff? Neighborhood stuff? I mean, you know, look, I came out to a few friends in, in like junior high school or middle school as they call it now. And it, my cousin, it, it was a very slow thing, but I never denied it to myself. Never. But it impacted your career. The Johnny Carson thing, I'm sticking in my head. Yeah, right? that, did, that's did you exactly. Say to yourself, I've hey, never told that story. You're getting an exclusive, Steve. Like you did it on PBS, so that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah it is. Did you say to yourself, I, I got to back off on this? No. Never. No, and I'll tell you something. At that time, I wasn't talking about being gay on stage. I still kind of don't. It's about this much. You know, I, it's, you know, but I was doing impressions of women, not in drag, but I was doing Julia Child and Betty Davis. And, you know, if you didn't know, you were an idiot. So, it, but I never was talking about going out with guys, or, and I certainly didn't lie and talk about being attracted to women. I didn't do that at all. But hold on, you're, you're one person show show on Broadway. Yeah. You, I spoke about it, but it was, it was like, if you look at it, it's a, it's a minute or two. I, I, I don't, I don't talk about my husband. I don't talk, I mean, it's, it's you've I'm, been together I'm, a long time. Yeah, 20 years. I mean, it's very, I, we don't, I don't celebrate. But you guys it. perform together. Yeah, we do. He could wrote. Could you plug that? He, he, what, could I plug what? Plug the, the fact that you perform together. We do perform. Well, he, well, he writes all my music. He wrote all the original music in Laugh Whore. He's writing, all the original Left music. was one of your... first one-man show on Broadway, and then um, I'm, do, I'm working on another one called Mario Cantone Swings Both Ways. So, Mario yeah. Cantone Swings Both, Both ways. ways. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to have a kind of a... a sw I, I, I want to have like a full band and stuff. So with some swing, because I sing. I love music. No kidding. I love music. I love, music. I love know, it. I, 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 and I can't do it. I, I mean, I rarely do clubs. I do either performing arts centers or casinos where I can have a band and... 
I'm like old school Vegas with an edge. That's what yeah. my show is. But go back to the I, go back to the Sex and the City thing what? that you don't think I watched, but I did. Yeah. I even saw the movie, which a little painful. Well, um, the first one was good. Second shouldn't have been made. <laughs> uh, but that this, it's like the third Godfather. Let's not talk about. No, it. No, I know. So let's do this. Know, it's a tough one. Anthony. Yeah. The character. Yeah. What did it do for your career? It made me international. It's unbelievable. You when I go to Paris or, it's amazing. I mean. Uh, you're, it's crazy. It's, do they call you Anthony? Yeah, they do. And some of them say Mario, or they just go, Sex in the City. It's, it's, it's just such a phenomenon. It's crazy what happened with that show. But that was written for me. Michael Patrick King. Oh, are you yawning out there? No, I just burped, actually. It was gas. You know, Italians have Thanks gas sometimes. You, you know, you asked. I'm very open with you, Steve. I, I, just, I just wanted to make sure yeah, you... I'd good. rather you burp than yawn, no, frankly, I didn't in yawn. the middle of an interview. No, but, but go ahead. keep talking, and the yawn is coming. Um, <laughs> Michael Patrick King, who I met in 1980. By the way, the crew all of a sudden, you guys are paying attention all of a sudden. Look how great you crew. I love the crew. I feel very, very safe with the crew here. They're, they're tough. I nice. love the guys. It's a lot tougher than us. I love that. They're great. Um, Michael Patrick King, I met in 1984 at the Improv. Right. And he, um, he's always, he was doing stand-up, and he always had that director, writer's mentality of throwing stuff at me to improv and coming back from a gig in Jersey in the backseat of a car. I mean, he, he, he was always brilliant. And he, the third season of that show, when he kind of got the creative reins, uh, he got a hold of the, 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 the creative control of that show, he called me up and said, I wrote you something. And it was two scenes, Charlotte's wedding, her second wedding, and I, or her first wedding. And there was a second scene that was filmed where I cut the dress in, by accident because she was being panicky. And, and, and she... Um, Freaks out, freaks out on me, we have this argument. And they cut that scene, which was good because that means that we didn't have a fight and it wasn't over. I ended up coming back. So it was just one scene. And then they, he said, we got a lot of calls about you and a lot of letters. And I said, am I coming back? And he said, oh yeah. Do you love so the cast? I do. I had a great time with that. Good I mean, people. That, the, the, I, had, I, I was very close with Kim, um, still am. I'm very friendly with Sarah. Um, uh, and Cynthia, I've known, I love her. Just had dinner with her recently. She, she's a, I've known her since the theater day. I mean, she, mm. she, she comes from the theater, so I met her when we were doing an off-Broadway show together called June Moon when she mm. got that show, when she got Sex in the City. And Kristen lives in L.A., so I hardly see her. Let's but. talk on ensemble real quick. Yes. Uh, you, you do, you've done The View a lot. Yeah. As we take this show in yeah. the spring of 2013, lots of stuff going on over yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. You could do the you could do the part. What's her name's leaving? Joy, who Joy. we love. Yes. Um, I've done her show before. Yeah. We're trying to get her in here. I love her. She's the best. She, uh, well, you could do that. They, it's a show. The View, they're never going to... This happened when, when Rosie left. There was all this rumor that I was going to take over. It's never, and I don't know how that happened and how that even got out. But it was... I mean, as soon as I heard it, I was like, well, that's not true. It's, it's a woman show. I mean, it's, it's, that, that cast is going to be always be a woman. But I've been doing that show for 15 years. Yes. And it's because Joy brought me on that show in the first place. So uh, she... She's supportive of other talented people. She always people. came to get me. How great there are that? people like her and Michael Patrick King and Joe Mantello, who directed three out of my five Broadway shows that I've been in. He, always, they come get you. And I need that, because I'm an awful auditioner. I'm terrible in the room. You good, you good at marketing yourself? No, oh God. The, the Twitter and the Facebook, oh, it's, I'm, it's homework. What? It's unbearable. Ugh. I, if I have a gig, I'll plug it. But guess what, I'm not doing it. Do you have anything you want to plug right now? I'm going to be um, in Atlantic City, um, April 20th. That'll okay, be, you got a comedy tour coming up? Anything uh, else? No, no. What are you I, doing here? I, I just, exactly, that's what I said. So I said we I saw got nothing you, to... you know why you're here? Why? Because I said I want to marry you on the studio. Well, and I, I'm, you didn't have a publicist reach out no. for us? You didn't reach out? Yeah. This is the big show we're on every night on public television. Well, well, stop looking around. We who, are, who trust are me. Who are you, Steve? Get out of here. I do BB. <laughs> I do beep up. This no, starts, well, you I'll don't tell actually you, have to air And also, show, March, March, March 28th, I'm co-hosting The View, and it's a big show that I actually co-host and really run it. Oh, good. The it's show fun. will after, after, after that. It will? Well, great. Um, when is this running, this thing? Mario, listen. We, oh, you're, yes. We're leaving now? You are terrific. No, I, you're very sweet. I felt like you were a cousin a little bit. I can't believe we, we didn't know each other at Channel 9. We did. Listen, I always knew you, because you were a bigger, much bigger star than I was. Oh, yeah, I know. It was huge. You're huge. I was huge. Hey, could you could do an impression going out to the break? Who do you want me Liza, to Liza, anyone. Camera 2. Camera Is that working? Stop it. Camera <laughs> 2, trust me. Anything you want out of Camera 2, go. Anything. Steve Abudado. 
Out of Pado. But Abu Babo. He's so terrific, Steve Abu Labo. He's so good. He he looks like Tony Bennett. I love him. We should <laughs> he's he's got 35 Tony. years, Abby. 40 yeah, years. No, when he was young. Okay. I love Tony Bennett. I called him Uncle Tony. <laughs> Come get me. I don't know where I am. Thank you. All right. You're the best. Bye. Nice. Tell your wife I said hello. I will. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Jerry Capisi is with us. He's a reporter, columnist, author. He is the founder of uh, ganglandnews.com. Go check it out. Everything you ever wanted, needed to know about organized crime. He is the country, in my opinion, the foremost expert on the mob, organized crime. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Steve. <laughs> uh, you wrote for uh, the Daily News on the subject for how many years? Uh, I was at the News for about 13 years. I had the column there, uh, Gangland, for about five or six years. And let's, uh, by the way, let's plug some of your books before we uh, get into some characters. Sounds good to me. Bob Morris, our director, let's uh, put the book up and Jerry can say what it is. Let's go to the first one. Idiot's Guide, right? Yeah, The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Mafia. It's not a history of the mob. It's... Uh, Anything and everything you didn't think to ask or you might have asked or wanted to ask about uh, the mob, uh, where it comes from, what it's all about, how they make money, and some of the silly, stupid things that they do. You know. Got it. What's next? Gangland. That's um, the first 15 years or so of my uh, columns. It uh, started in the Daily News in 88, 89. They ran for about five or six years then. And since then, it's been online. And... Uh, so it's a combination of uh, stuff that was in the Daily News, stuff that was online, and also a couple of columns that made the uh, New York Sun, which also ran my column for a couple of years. Mob Star. Uh, Mob Star, the 2002 edition. That's the, uh, um, the second edition of Mob Star. It's basically the complete saga of John Gotti. It came out um, a couple of days after he passed away, as a matter of fact, in 2002. Everything from his... Uh, uh, original acquittal to his ultimate uh, conviction and uh, his death in prison. Murder Machine. Murder Machine. Um, this is the book about the scariest bunch of uh, serial gangster killers ever, the people that Gene Mustaine and I found out about while we were writing a book about John Gotti. Is Roy DeMeo in there? Roy DeMeo was uh, the guy in there, and exactly how we got onto that story was we were listening to a tape-recorded conversation between Gene Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero, and they were talking about John... Black, Black. Angel, quack, Angel, quack. Right. Yeah, okay. that's the guy. And they were talking about John Gotti not wanting to whack uh, Roy DeMeo because he had an army. And we said, who is this guy that John Gotti's afraid of? And that's what... And finally... Said. And Gotti Rise and Fall is the uh, book that we did uh, in 1995, 1996. It's the, basically the story of Gotti and his conviction and the beginning of his uh, uh, life sentence in prison. Uh... This is one of these interviews that I've been wanting to do for a long time and track you down. You're hard to find. <laughs> uh, because I have a lot of questions for you. John Gotti, all these years later, why are we even interested in him? Still interested. It's not just me. Well, I'm curious about this guy. Well, there's a couple of reasons. I think uh, he was the Dapper Don. And the key thing that um, created him or made him into a... Uh, quote, folk hero, public enemy number one, is he beat the case. He was the first and pretty, I think the only still mafia boss to beat a racketeering conviction. He now, was, jury tampering does help, Paul. It, though, it no? does help when you got the jury <laughs> fixed. You know, that's why at some point we did manage to call him the bogus boss yes. because of that. But it, it, does, uh, it does help to have the jury on your side, yes. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons why his, his name is still out there is his son, took over the crime family, was an acting boss, was prosecuted four times for various, uh, you know, And now activity. today, uh, young Mr. Gotti is? Uh, he is a um, free and clear individual. He beat the case four times in a row. Uh, not uh, an acquittal, but uh, good enough for him. He was uh, got a hung jury four times in a row. Uh, it, t there is always something still going on around the Gambino crime family. Uh, you know, uh, 2011, they had this big... Uh, Mafia takedown day, 127 guys, and they arrested a guy who was uh, a Gambino soldier who was involved in a murder back in, 19, a double murder back in the 1980s, 1981, double homicide. 
So he goes to trial in 2013, and the Gotti name is out there again. It's uh, uh, John Gotti. He was only the boss of the family for about five years, but he had an amazing impact on the Gambino crime family and the mob itself. You know, Jerry, what I'm often curious about is today, you know, in 2013, as we do this show, um, after the RICO statutes mm -hmm. have been in place for all these years, after it appears that, that, that the five families, as they were originally constituted, um, have been busted up mm -hmm. by the feds, it's been such a priority <coughs> after Hoover was gone, right? And the federal government took it seriously. It appears on the surface, for those who are not experts in the mm -hmm. subject, like myself, but are curious, that it's not only not what organized crime was, but disorganized, not together, not that many of them anymore, and not that influential. Are we naive and wrong about that? Uh, no, I think you hit all the, uh, all the hot spots and the, the, the main points. Uh, it is still an organized crime. It's still five crime families. They're not as organized as they once were. They don't have as much clout as they used to, especially in the big uh, money-making activities that you know, kept them going, uh, which is the labor racketeering, the control of legitimate businesses, the private sanitation industry, the trucking industry, the construction industry. Their clout and impact in those areas has been um, reduced substantially. Uh, there are still gangsters who are involved in that kind of stuff, um, and they're always looking, to, it's a cat and mouse game. So, you know, you go after them in this area and they'll try to do something else. Um, the mob is still out there though. I mean, they still have five crime families. The bosses now are a lot less uh, showy. Uh, they don't walk around Broadway anymore. Or Little Italy uh, saying, come right. on out and look at me, here I am, like John Gotti did. Um, they have a lot more difficulty running their crime families. Another thing that's made them less effective is the bosses of the crime families uh, still trying to maintain control while they're in prison a thousand miles away. Makes it a little easier uh, to get uh, for them to go off and go astray. I'm curious, after all the years of writing about uh, the mob, organized crime, um, the mafia that uh -huh. some who are Italian-American, don't even like you to use that word, which I find interesting. Being Italian-American yourself, uh -huh. I've always been curious about this. Were you ever, did you ever feel threatened yourself that you were in a tough spot because you, you wrote so honestly, directly, and candidly about these guys? Uh, well, I, I, I wouldn't meet people in dog alleys. I mean, you know, common sense does prevail. I've never really been threatened. Uh, by anyone with a name. And everybody in the business, yourself included, I'm sure gets anonymous, silly phone calls. But I've never been threatened, so to speak, uh, for anything that I did or was about to do. I mean, when you went into the courtroom in the John Gotti days, and this is in the early 80s before they had um, detention became a big thing and, right. you know, they put people in jail awaiting trial, um, they would sit in the courtroom and they were big guys and they would look at you and let you know that they were not happy that you were there. But they never actually threatened you in any, you know, any way, shape, or form, at least with me. I mean, I did have a shouting match with Gene Gotti at one point. Basically, it was... John Gotti's brother, Gene. Gene Gotti, right. Basically, it wasn't really a shouting match. He was doing the shouting, and I was saying, I'm sorry you feel that way, Gene. I really, <laughs> I really tried... It was right after the first book came out, and I said, look, we wrote that he was acquitted. This was after that 1987 acquittal. We did write that he was acquitted, so... Um, yeah. I really haven't had too many difficulties with them. They kind of treat me as a necessary evil. Our, uh, not our, but for many, the, the romance, the, the, the way that many have looked at the mob mm -hmm. and tried to, um, all the way back to Al Capone, maybe not, even before, I'm reading a book about Capone right now, that many have tried to look at these guys as, come on, they wouldn't hurt regular people. Um, regular citizens, and they weren't involved in, in stuff that would really hurt people. A lot of these guys were thugs. A lot of these guys did hurt regular people. They hurt regular businesses, because if they're saying to a regular business, if you don't pay us, then you're going to have a problem. I mean, that's hurting a business. That whole fantasy in our heads that they're only going to hurt each other, and they're only doing business with each other, that just wasn't true. 
Definitely not. I mean, that's the Godfather mentality. The, the Godfather basically glorified the mob. I think a more realistic... Does the Sopranos make it more real? Uh, definitely. And I think before that, the, the movie that made it more real was Goodfellas. I mean, here you had guys that killed people just because they didn't like the way you looked. And there was no crime too, too big. They had $6 million from Kennedy Airport. That's no right. No crime too small. They were stealing quarters right, out of parking Right, from the Lutanza meters. deal the to... Meters. Right. Parking meters. Always right. looking for a buck. Oh, no matter what it is. And they kill people just, you know, for no reason. So no, that's the real, um, I guess, you know, the way the, the mob was portrayed accurately you know, on the big screen was Goodfellas. And Sopranos was a good... Um, you know, you like the Sopranos. Good job too. I, I, I thought it was a pretty good show. Yes, I, I thought it was a good show. I did not take the position and do not take the position that it was uh, uh, an anti-Italian show. Or, you did know, not. Do did not. not. It, it, I, no, I the position was, was this, it was a show about gangsters. It was a show about Italian-American gangsters. It's a small percentage of criminal of people out there, but they do exist. And I think um, Chase uh, and his crew did a good job of putting it on the screen and making it Believable. What they did, which was interesting, Two seconds. Go ahead. Uh, was that they, they made Tony Soprano? They gave him some redeeming values that made you feel like a lot of times rooting for him against the the other gangsters and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, only part of that's true. <laughs> Jerry, I want to thank you for joining us. We encourage everyone to go on your website to find out more, and uh, I appreciate you coming in and sharing. It's been fun, uh, Steve. Thank you. Wish you nothing but the best. Thanks thank again. You. And to you too. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, TSE&G, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Roche, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by New Jersey State Nurses Association. New Jersey nurses play a key role in the lives of everyone, from a school nurse teaching a diabetic child about injections, to a visiting nurse helping an elderly mother die at home, or someone like me, a nursing administrator for a health care organization. Whatever the role, nurses are there for you. And the New Jersey State Nurses Association has been protecting the practice of nursing and quality patient care since 1902, because caring for you and your families is what is most important to us.